So why am I here? Um, I'm on my way to Whitehorse, Yukon, uh, tomorrow to talk to them about um, how the Yukon is definitely in the crosshairs of some of the major issues facing et cetera. And Justin's a friend of mine, so I'm, I spent the night here and volunteered to, to speak. So who am I and, and why am I speaking on these things? Um, I'm just a normal guy who in his 20s uh, or late teens saw our environment tell me that I should go make a lot of money. I should go into business because that's what makes me have status and respect um, in society. So I went to Wall Street and I managed money for billionaires. I used to cold call people with $100 million or more. And um, I quickly noticed that they were no happier than the clerks making 20 grand a year processing their trades. And I did the whole Wolf of Wall Street thing. Uh, when I was in my 20s, I made $500,000 a year and I spent it all uh, every year on various things. Um, and I gradually started to read about energy and the environment. I read Bill McKibben's End of Growth. Um, I read Last Hours of Ancient Sunlight, Daniel Quinn's series on Ishmael. And it just struck me one weekend that this is all happening while I'm on the planet. And it just hit me that I was wasting my time turning digits into more digits and uh, so I gave all my clients their money back and I traveled around North America uh, for six months, actually in British Columbia. I spent three months um, between Prince Rupert and, and Vancouver Island with my dog with a backpack full of books, reading about ecology, the environment, human behavior, et cetera. And that was in 2004. And I then went and got my PhD at the University of Mo Vermont and I've spent the last 10 years researching our predicament. And it's my opinion that we can't just look at one aspect of the problem. We have to look at an integrated uh, view of where we're at. And um, before I go further, I should say that I've spent all my money that I had saved and I'm now living on around $40,000 a year and I've never been happier. And so this what I'm going to tell you today is not like a bunch of facts to persuade you about something because people don't respond necessarily to facts. They respond to um, internalization of experiences. So what I hope that you take away from tonight is, yeah, that makes sense. I can see that in my own life. Um, and so with that, uh, I will get started. Um, so you hear on the news all the time these very articulate, charismatic, persuasive people, this is the problem and this we need to do. And so what I'm going to try to do tonight is to parse our situation into uh, what I believe are first principles or, or core principles. And those are uh, energy and how energy relates to money, um, the environment and human behavior. And I'm going to go through those three and then offer a synthesis of how everything fits together, where we are in 2014, and then I'm going to finish with um, some suggestions on maybe what you could take away and do in your own lives, or at least things that I think are worthwhile doing. This summer I gave a similar talk, and it was 207 slides, and I vowed to never do that much in one talk, and tonight there's 213 slides, so uh, <laughs> strap yourself in. <laughs> Um, so first, let's start with energy. Okay, so energy underpins everything in nature. There's every aspect of nature. There's an energy input, um, and all the way down the lowest trophic levels, um, there's photosynthesis, and then herbivores eat the grass, and there's an energy loss, and then the predators eat the herbivores, and then there's an energy loss. And I have a sun shining on me right now, um, and the sun underlie, underpins the entire trophic pyramid. Um, so in the human economy, it's very much the same. We use ancient sunlight in the form of fossil carbon. We use old sunlight in the form of uh, timber. And we use current sunlight in the form of crops and animal power, et cetera, to power our economy. So that energy input ripples through our economy in the form of wages, higher profits, lower priced stuff, and more people. Um, 
50% of the uh, nitrogen, or 50% of the protein and 80% of the nitrogen in our bodies can be directly um, linked to the CH4 from the Haber-Bosch process in, in natural gas. Whereas 100 years ago, 200 years ago, people were made from sunlight, we were kind of partially made from fossil fuels. Um, so no matter what product you make in the world, you first need an energy conversion. You need to convert energy into something. No matter how you make a cup with a coconut, with plastic, with tin, with metal, you first need an energy conversion. There are no exceptions to this rule. And back in the day when we stopped being hunter-gatherers and started to um, farm uh, stationary places, we harnessed the ecosystem services of the soil and the sun and rain with some human labor and we produced a surplus. And fast forward till now, um, every single part of our economies is fully dependent on an energy input. The red line is GDP. Various uh, energy measures. And the more dedicated an energy measure is to doing work, um, the more correlated it is with, with GDP. For example, the, light, the, the blue line on top is electricity. It's incredibly correlated with, um, uh, with GDP. Now, you might ask, well, how do you know which one's causing the other? In one, in one sense, it doesn't matter. Because if you think about a factory and it needs to produce one more unit of whatever, to produce that one more unit, it's going to need a little bit more energy. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I use Stephen Harper. I don't know of a lot of famous Canadians other than Getty Lee and the tragically hip, so I was like, I, I'll just use him. But it turns out he is an economist. But the traditional economists um, think that energy is just one of many inputs. So what? We'll just replace it with something else. But energy is not substitutable by anything other than energy. Um, so if you consider everything on this graph. It all costs around $100, slightly less today. Uh, coffee machine, sushi, boots, alcohol, glasses, and oil. But what's so special about oil that makes it better than all these other things? It has the embodied energy potential, 5.7 million British thermal units of energy. Translated into work potential is 1,700 kilowatt hours of work. Well, how much work is that? Well, me digging ditches or shoveling snow up in Whitehorse or doing manual labor I do six-tenths of one kilowatt hour in one day of work. So a barrel of oil, which was condensed and formed over 200 million years, and we extract it for 50 or $60 and sell it to the market for $100, substitutes 11 years of me working. The average American makes $44,000 a year. I don't know about Canada, but similar probably. And so one barrel of oil ripples through our economy uh, to the effect of $500,000 of, of human work potential. So the average American uses 60 barrel of oil equivalents of oil, coal, and natural gas. Canadians are a little bit more. Um, and so we have virtually hundreds of fossil slaves walking behind us, unseen, uncomplaining. Most of us don't even know that. Um, they don't talk, but we're discovering, many of you in the audience are concerned about climate change, that they poop and they breathe, which I'm going to talk a little bit about later. So um, one of the properties of fossil fuels that are so powerful is the energy density. This is me. I'm about one-tenth of a horse. That's my horse, which is one horse. Um, this is my utility vehicle, which is 45 horsepower. And this is my truck, 150 horsepower. And the amount of diesel fuel in this bottle of beer could power that truck for four or five miles up and down snowy, hilly roads. And imagine humans, a bunch of humans, walking behind trying to do that. So this is a graph of our uh, global fuel use over the last 200 years. The bottom beige color is uh, biomass, mostly trees. Um, where I got my PhD in Vermont in the 1850s, 1860s, it was clear cut. And we used all the trees for fuel and timber and et cetera. And then we found uh, fossil carbon. The gray is coal, the green is oil, the red is natural gas, um, the light blue is nuclear, the dark blue is hydro, and the little sliver on top is um, renewables. I'm going to talk about the letters a little bit later. But wait a minute. 
Standard economics says that the Cobb-Douglas function, which says capital and labor, are all that matter, along with this productivity factor. But no, it's actually energy that underpins everything. Capital and labor are dependent variables on energy. Uh, I live in Wisconsin, it's a dairy state. If you consider uh, milking cows, manually it takes 30 minutes per day per person to milk a cow, $3 per hour, no additional electricity. But once you start to automate it, you add um, 300 kilowatt hours per cow, um, drops the human time down to 15 minutes, but the wages go up to $5 an hour. Um, the fully automated milking machines drop the human input down to three minutes per cow, 700 kilowatt hours per cow, and raises the, the wage $15 an hour. This is a story of what we've done in industrialization. Let me give more of a British Columbia example. If you are a lumberjack and you sell your lumber for firewood, you can make $5 an hour using an ax. But once you, uh, then you, then you invite a friend over and the two of you together can carry bigger logs and do a little bit more. There's a comparative advantage. So you make $15 an hour divided by two is $7.50 an hour. But then once we mechanize and add fossil carbon, in this case, an uh, asphalt road ma made from oil, um, it, it makes things easier to transport, et cetera. We add 50 units of mechanized labor and it raises the wage to like $12 an hour. And then we add chainsaws, which are incredibly powerful machines. And we raise the wage to $23 an hour, but we're replacing one or two humans with 100 fossil slaves. And then we add um, big machines to move the logs and our wages go up to $40 an hour, but 200 units. And then we add um, trucks to transport the logs our wages go very high, um, but we're using a lot of these units of fossil labor um, inefficiently. So what happens when gasoline price doubles from $2 to $4? Well, we're still very rich, we're still very profitable, but the wages um, are reduced quite a bit. What happens when we go from $4 to $6? The wages come down quite a bit. And what's interesting now is the 400, the, the, the processes that required 400 units of energy, they even drop to less profitable than the ones that are using less energy. Our benefits are declining. There's like a tea bubbling or some whistling noise in here, Justin. What is that? Oh, you don't know? Okay, well, carry on. Um, so this is, um, this is a graph showing the extraction cost of oil for the oil majors break even with dividends and capital expenditures from 1999, which is uh, $9 um, break even, and uh, 2014 is $120. So this is the extraction break even cost for the largest oil companies in the world. Um, so we've kind of gone through the easy to find stuff and now we're having to dig deeper or look in environmentally sensitive areas or et cetera. So this is uh, three of the largest oil companies in the world. Their extraction costs, um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, their um, capital expenditures in the orange line and their production in the blue line. And I'm gonna have a lot of slides that I'm gonna go really fast and just kind of get the, the, the general gist and that's sufficient. But wait, the message that we get from the media is that there's plenty of energy and technology is gonna access what we need. Well, in nature, there's something called optimal foraging theory, which suggests that animals always are uh, very sensitive to the energy payoff of their lives. And if a cheetah goes and chases a bunch of mice all day long, he might be 100% successful, but there's not enough energy in the mouse to allow for metabolism, maintenance, mating, reproduction, uh, energy for the offspring, et cetera. So the higher energy payoff that you get in nature, the more um, options and the more survivable you, you will have. And the same thing happens in the human environment. We have, uh, in the 1930s, the, the oil was right underneath the surface and we would invest one barrel of oil and get out over 100 back. By the 1970s, that ratio went down to kind of 30 to one. And by the year 2000, it was in the lower teens. So we have this um, uh, declining uh, um, energy payback and in economic theory they think everything's just going to get cheaper over time like the blue line like toasters 
But actually, energy follows a different curve. And right now, we're experiencing year-over-year -year price increases in energy, and that has big impacts. Well, what about technology? Well, technology, there's kind of four ways that I could explain technology. One way is, is it, it, we use technology to create things that humans used to do themselves, like chainsaws or weed eaters or driving a car, et cetera. Another way is we invent new ways to use energy, um, which like Facebook or, or things like that. Um, and then the other two ways are we make things more efficient, like insulation or efficiency or power plant um, uh, conversion, et cetera. And then the fourth way is we design ways to harness energy, like solar panels or geothermal or new ways to fracture oil and gas. But most technology is in the first two camps. In other words, technology is mostly just a vector to allow for more energy use in a larger human heat engine. So if you think about Facebook and, <clears throat> you know, doing, uh, mowing the lawn, they end up freeing up time to do other things that, you know, they're great time savers. Today, Justin, what was that called, Justin, that we did today? Uh, car to go. Car to go. What a cool thing. Yeah. It was like $3. I thought that was awesome. And then we got to Justin's a half hour early, and I was just checking my email and looking at Facebook. So it saved us time for me to do what? Um, so, you know, I think it's a great thing, but we'll, we'll talk about that later. Um, so, um, energy prices are, are going up. Um, I don't want to get into the, actually they've gone down the last two weeks and that's a bad thing because oil prices at $80 are now below the cost of extraction for a lot of areas and so they're going to stop drilling. So, um, okay, so why do we care? Well, why do we care about energy and energy prices? Well, if we built this civilization when energy cost less than 5% of our GDP. And we're headed for a world where energy is going to cost 10 to 15% of our GDP. It's going to go up a lot in price. I don't know about next year, but in the next 10 or 20 years. And what that means is that the benefits, we have 19 out of 20 benefits for all kinds of non-energy pursuits. Those are going to go down to 1 in 10 or, or 9 uh, benefits in our economy. So this is a chart showing um, top left column, one kilowatt hour of work costs an American uh, human $260 to do relative to all those very cheap energy, mostly fossil energy. The middle column shows how many basically substitutes, how many fossil slaves we're getting for that one unit of electricity or, or gasoline. So the quantity and price of applied energy are very key drivers of our civilization. Um, so this is the dark side of how cheap energy is. Cheap energy gives us higher wages, it gives us higher profits, it gives us cheaper stuff, but also the owners of capital at some point can choose to not hire human workers, they can hire mechanized fossil labor. And here we see over the last 130 years that wages peaked 40 years ago in, in America, and yet productivity continued on. And this is part of the explanation for that. Okay, so in order to understand energy, we have to understand money. What is money? Well, that I just explained that energy is really what we have to spend, then money is kind of a claim on future energy. Now, the money in your pockets now, you're going to buy breakfast tomorrow morning, so it's a claim on energy tomorrow morning, but you could save it for 10 years. And it's a claim on energy a decade from now. But energy and natural resources are really what power the economy, and money is just the financial representation for that. So money is financial capital, and financial capital is a marker for real capital. Real capital, in an ecological economic sense, is natural capital, which is our healthy rivers, our streams, our forests, our oil, um, our trees, this is my backyard. Um, social capital is our friends, our networks, our relationships. Uh, in this case, it's my, my puppy and my dogs. Built capital is um, what we turn primary wealth into, uh, things that we use. Um, this is my house, solar panels, an aloe vera plant, some chainsaws, a grill, um, it's uh, things that we use in our lives. And the fourth type of capital is human capital, which is our skills, our knowledge, our health. Um, etc. So, um, let me skip that. Um, 
so, oh, I know, I know what I was going to say about this. So, so back in the day when we stopped roaming and became uh, more sedentary 10 or 12,000 years ago, what we were trying to optimize then was surplus. We all worked and combined with the, the ecosystem flows to have um, surplus grain production. And now fast forward and we're looking at surplus value, which is we're optimizing stock markets and bonds, et cetera. But economics textbook, textbooks state that banks create money as intermediaries. They're just brokers that, that change wealth between people. But the truth is something more profound. And the truth is that banks create 95% of our money in Canada and the United States and in England and in China uh, is created from commercial banks. And if you wanted to start a business in Vancouver, and you went to the bank and you were credit worthy, they would put a half a million dollars in your account. And at the same time, they would put a half a million dollar IOU asset in the bank's account. But what the textbooks don't really say is that at that moment, $500,000 of purchasing power entered his account. It did not leave anywhere in the system. At that moment, $500,000 of more money grew. And knowing what we know about energy, that's a problem. Um, every year since I've been on the planet, on the left, curve, we in the United States, and pretty much the world as well, because every country runs this way, has created more debt every year than we've grown our GDP. And if you, debt does not have to be a bad thing. If we go into debt and create some great business from it, then it could be a good thing. But the right curve shows um, how much GDP we get for each additional debt dollar. And you can see over the last 30 years, it's been declining, declining, and declining. We have to add more and more debt every year just to grow GDP just a little bit. And once it's below one, it's unsustainable. Once it gets to zero, well, at that point, we're just transmuting wealth into income. So all countries in the world are following this general model. We create money to follow and go and do resources and extraction and business, but it's, it's unsustainable. So what's really happening right now, this is a, pic a real picture from the Philippines where a helicopter dropped money. But imagine that some helicopters came over Vancouver tomorrow and they dropped $10 billion of cash. What would happen? Well, a bunch of people right on the scene would grab like $500,000 and a bunch of people would have 50 grand and other people would have 10 grand and eventually. So what would happen? Vancouver's economy would boom. People would be buying trucks and going on vacations and all kinds of cool stuff. But nothing happened with resources at the time. Resources would then, there would be more people buying, uh, energy companies would have to produce more energy, et cetera. This is what's happening to the world economy right now. We're papering over energy decline with money. Um, I'm gonna skip these two for time. All right, moving on to human behavior. So we are, not fallen angels, we are risen apes. And this has profound implications for where we find ourselves in this uh, predicament on the planet. We evolved from apes. Not the apes alive today, but different apes six or seven million years ago. We have 99% the same DNA as chimpanzees. We have 90% the same as uh, a cow, 80% the same as a cat, 70% the same as a mouse, 60% the same as a fruit fly, 50% the same as a banana. We all came from earlier organisms. What's really fascinating is that the 99%, the 1% difference that we have from chimpanzees, half of that difference is in our olfactory, our, our, how good we smell. And virtually no difference is in the brain, except for one protein that codes how many time, how many iterations in the fetus there is in the brain. We have three times the neurons of a monkey's brain because a protein codes to go through that process several times in, in uterus. And, and so, you know, it's, it's, I'm gonna talk about why this matters. Um, so this is kind of our, our family tree. And I think Canada is a little bit more enlightened on this topic. A lot of places in the United States, I don't even show these slides because I'm afraid I'm gonna get like jerked off the stage. But we are related to the other primates. Um, and why is this important? Well, our brains evolved in a period of a long, long period of privation and scarcity. 
And so the behaviors that we have today are remnants of what our ancestors did. Our brain kind of has three general structures. We have a, 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 a reptilian inner core, um, which was from way back. Uh, we have a mammalian limbic emotional system, and then we have the neocortex on top and forward, which is our analytical capacity to figure out how we're going to degrow and how to pay mortgage payments and, and things like that. Um, but all three um, tentatively work miracles together when all three parts of our brain are, are working together. But sometimes one of them will balloon off like, uh, like an elephant and, and uh, wreak havoc. <laughs> Okay, so no one really jumped there. Usually someone in the front like jumps, so this guy's really mellow. But <laughs> that was an example of when your fight or flight's like, well, hey, what's going on? And it's overtaking your conscious awareness of, of what's happening. Um, okay, so I'm gonna talk about several aspects of our behavior that are, uh, that are relevant. So we care about the present, and we're told that we are impacting the biosphere and that there's a problem. Actually, they've researched more, and we are responsible for climate change, at least 50%, and we have to act soon. Actually, we're 95% sure it's humans are causing it, and we need to act in the next 20 years. Actually, we are incredibly certain about climate change, and we need to do something about it now. Hey, were you a little worried about that? No, let's just go get some poutine and a beer, and holy crap, Godzilla's in Vancouver. <laughs> And that is how our brains work. We think about things, and until the, we see the whites of the eyes of the crisis, we don't do, really do anything. And that's a problem because our brains evolved facing saber-toothed tigers and instant dangers, and the real dangers that we're facing are kind of like real slow, long-term things. So you can imagine why that happened um, over evolutionary time, because those organisms that deferred consumption would have been outcompeted. So that's called a discount rate. A discount rate is a measure between zero and one. Uh, zero means you care about the distant future the same as you care about today. One is you care about the next three seconds. Only if you feed a goldfish, um, you're going out of town, three days of food, he'll eat it all in 10 minutes and blow up and die. So it's just a measure uh, of that. And, you know, when you talk to young people, they're, like, excited to get a job and stuff. They're not thinking about 50 years from now. Okay, status, sexual selection. So in nature, this is a primary driver, is trying to compete to get a mate. A peacock example, a peacock uses a lot of energy and eating minerals and bugs and stuff to grow this ornate tail. Also, the tail is more visible to a predator also, if a predator does see him, it's going to be harder for him to fly away because of all that bulky display. All three of those negative fitness hits are overcome by the drab female pe peahen's preference for males with super showy tails. It's called sexual selection, and it's uh, very rampant in our culture as well. <laughs> And every year, you see some billionaire will announce that his ship is going to be three feet longer than the current world record ship. And um, so think about this thought experiment. It was actually a real study. Would you rather a house that's 4,000 square foot in size in a neighborhood of 6,000 square foot house, or would you prefer a smaller house, a 3,000 square foot house, where all your neighbor's houses were even smaller yet, a 2,000 square foot house? Well, take a guess. Most people would prefer the smaller house as long as it was bigger than their neighbor's houses. And there's so many aspects, and everyone chuckles. Why? Because we see this so many areas of our lives where we don't really care about the absolute, we care about the relative. I think it was, uh, I forgot the guy's name, but he said, true richness is to make $1 a year more than my wife's sister's husband. So in nature, there is a negative feedback to overconsumption. A lion could not physically er eat that third gazelle because it would get stuck in his gullet. A deer antlers can only get so physically big or they'll fall over and die. In the human system, there's actually positive feedbacks. We do things because we can. We build more and more. I used to manage money for billionaires, and they wanted 300 million until they quit at 500 million, but then at 500 million, their buddies had 800 million, and they just kept going. It's about the game. It's about the brain chemicals. Um, oh, and those guys, what's money for anyways? 
Well, at a young age, at 25, I was a broker for some of these guys, and they would call me, hey, yeah, where, where's IBM stock? And they'd be in the delivery room of their wife's or their, their daughter having a baby, and they'd be asking about their stock quotes. And that planted a seed in me that something's not right here. Um, okay, supernormal stimuli uh, habituation. So there's a field called ethology, which is the study of animal behavior. And they've done all kinds of things where they could put a fake baby bird in a nest and paint its, big, its beak bright red and make the beak wide. And the mama bird will repeatedly give worms and food to the fake baby and let her own baby starve to death because she's getting a signal of the things that were really strong in her evolutionary past, red and wide beak. Well, how many things can you think of in our current world that are like that? Let me start with an example about dopamine and behavior and, and habituation. So they did a test on thirsty monkeys where they had a, a headphone where they played a sound and they had a, a thing in their mouth where they squirted some fruit juice. They played a sound, squirted fruit juice, and the monkey didn't know what was coming. It was like, whoa! And his dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter associated with reward, went from three neurons to, to 60 per second. It was like, wow, that's really great. And then they did it a couple more times and continued. And after three or four times, played the sound, got the fruit juice, the dopamine response plunged. Why? Because the monkey had now expected the fruit juice. And it was like, this isn't interesting anymore. I need something different to get the same feeling of reward and of satisfaction. Now, how many things in your own life do you know are, are like that? So here's just a real quick um, a example, there's a, there's a disease called Parkinson's disease, which is a too little dopamine in one area of the brain. So there's a drug for it called Mirapex, and they give this drug to people, and it floods the brain all over with dopamine. And all kinds of patients were coming in, and one little old lady lost $150,000 gambling on, on slot machines, and a, a pastor had like 10 extramarital affairs, he had never cheated on his wife in his life, and there was all these kind of consumptive responses to too much dopamine. And dopamine is a very, very central neurotransmitter to our current culture. So if you think about it, every day we go through uh, and have these decision trees of a healthier choice and a less healthy choice. Uh, salad or burger, homework, video games, save the climate or go on vacation. But when we become habituated to higher and higher levels of stimulation, these little decision trees become harder and harder to make the right choice until we end up taking you know, more of the bad choices uh, because our brain, is, it's, a, it's an easy neural pathway to go there. Um, okay, cognitive biases. The whole problem with the world is that fools and fanatics are always so certain of themselves and wiser people so full of doubts. I agree. So we, it is adaptive to be optimistic, to not believe in the naysayers is actually adaptive. When we're optimistic, we have a reduction in the stress hormone called cortisol. Uh, it's better for our helper uh, T cells and our immune system. 95% of college professors think they're better than average at dealing with other people. And there's all sorts of examples that we oversell our own abilities and our own um, uh, skills because it's adaptive. It helps us in our lives. I'm going to skip that. So um, our brain is actually not one self. There's all kinds of little modules working in our brain at one time, and whichever one shouts the loudest at the moment is kind of the one in charge, kind of like a lunar module. There's all kinds of things that have to work at once. But that means that we have an enormous amount of biases, and um, the biases are almost too many... To, to list, but there's, there's hundreds of cognitive biases in humans, um, and it gets down to beliefs. And I know probably most of you in this audience believe that, that climate change is human-caused and that it's urgent, but I'm sure all of you that feel that way also know someone in your family or your sphere that believes the exact opposite. And there's many things like that in our world that we are absolutely sure about something and someone is absolutely sure about the opposite thing. And facts will not change those people's beliefs. They change differently. We are very, very certain about a lot of things when certainty is, is misplaced. Um, this is Stephen Hawking, one of the most brilliant people in the world, far smarter than I am. 
But he thinks the answer to climate change is to um, inhabit uh, Mars and, and other planets, that we need to terraform Mars. And so that's just an example of one aspect of human delusionality that we miss the truth because we're so focused on our own little viewpoint of things. Think, you know, love and lust and things like that are, are real to us, but stone and wood are, are not so much. So I think we go through life wearing these glasses that things are unicorn and fairy tales and rainbows and we don't really see reality. Why? Being delusional isn't bad. Being delusional helps our lives. It helps us get through the day. But being delusional about being delusional is screwing up the planet. <laughs> okay, so quickly, uh, d uh, overview of, of human behavior. We value the present uh, more than the future via something called the steep discount rate. We can easily become distracted and habituated to a novelty. Uh, via natural selection, we were programmed to compete for relative status uh, by whatever metric culture dictates. Um, our brains are like Swiss Army knives. We are not sentient or sapient and aggregate, but follow the momentum of the hive. Um, so, but we don't look out there and say, hey, yeah, if I meet that girl, I'm going to send my genes to the next, off uh, next generation. That's not what we how we think. We don't think about maximizing our fitness in the biological sense. We just follow environmental cues. We follow feelings that our ancestors met with success. Um, so the, the, the currency is neurotransmitters and hormones. And those are what speak to us and motivate us to do behavior. And in today's day and age, the things that are available in spades in this cornucopia of novelty and smorgasbord of experiences are much louder than climate change and peak oil and biodiversity loss. Okay, moving on to the environment. I've kept this section a little bit shorter than I usually would because I assume most of you are, are up on the science. We know that um, we're over 400 parts per million now on CO2. The acidity of the ocean, uh, it's 30% it's more acidic now than uh, before pre-industrial times. Uh, this is the, um, uh, the envelope of the different Celsius uh, projections for the next 100 years. Uh, my only comment here is, is um, things could be worse than this because of positive feedback, but I don't think the, the really high ones in the IPCC are likely because we don't have that much affordable fossil fuels. There's plenty of fossil fuels, but I think a lot of it is so deep and it's going to take too much energy and our current society won't be able to extract it. But maybe 50 years from now, we're going to have a smaller society and we're going to start coal seam fires in China or something crazy like that. I don't know. Um, I'm going to skip that. The other thing that bothers me about the climate argument is all the papers and all the media and everything stops at 2100, as if the climate stops changing in 2100. Once I die in the next 30 years or whatever, I don't care if one day after that or a thousand years after that mean the same to me. And we need to think beyond 2100 because stuff's still going to be, um, you know, accumulating and, and having an impact. So moving to something that I actually care extremely much about, uh, and that is the other creatures on the planet that we share uh, this N equals one Earth with. Um, we use, depending on the boundaries, between 25 and 40 percent of all the net primary productivity hitting the planet. Uh, I'm sure you've seen the statistics that most of the ocean uh, fisheries are either totally depleted, largely depleted, or in danger of being depleted. Um, we are uh, taking more than our share. Um, a lot of people are familiar with the human moonshot in population that uh, 12,000 years ago we were a million people and now we're 7.3 billion as of last week. But what people don't often look at is how that relates to natural zoo mass or the weight of all wild animals. 10,000 years BC, wild animals outweighed humans by over 100 to 1. Um, <coughs> The year 2000, we were at 40 to 1. We outweigh wild animals. The weight of all humans and all of our livestock that feed us are now, in 2014, 50 times more than the weight of all wild animals on the planet. And that's the 2050 projection based on population and, and consumption. And we are eating the rest of Earth. And you know what? No matter what your view is on climate change or peak oil or economics or degrowth, 
this is largely non-disputable. And plus it's happening with insects and, and other things. <laughs> so what's an armadillo for? I'll give you five seconds while I have one more drink of beer. So most people that I speak to, especially young people, they'll sit and they'll muse for 30 seconds and they'll say, don't we make boots from that? Some people make boots from that, right? An armadillo or a moose or a beaver or a spirit bear, they don't have to have a purpose. That's the problem. One of our problems is we think everything has to relate to humans and what we need them for. An armadillo is for an armadillo. It came from a, an evolutionary trajectory the same way that we did. Okay, I'm going to go quickly through this, um, but it's just a personal interest of mine. There's some people consider the fourth law of thermodynamics, which is the maximum power principle, which suggests that organisms and ecosystems self-organize so as to better degrade an energy source. An old growth forest, if you do a, a, a thermal scan from up above, you'll see that the trees are, the tall old growth trees are the coolest and the warmest will be the forest transect, the, the, the road that doesn't have anything growing on it. Nature has grown to degrade energy in the form of sunlight. Well, this is the same thing in the human sphere. We organized to degrade more of ecosystem flows. And amazingly, uh, 500 years ago, when Cortez came to South America, he found the same sort of infrastructure, the same palaces, the same priests, the same politicians, the same irrigation canals that were in the old world, and yet the cultures had been removed by 15,000 years. And so the same sort of energy degrading infrastructure happened spontaneously in the old world and the new world. And so I would argue that until the 1970s, we were expanding on an empty planet ecologically and energy-wise, and in order to keep growing our energy spigot in point B there, we went to globalization to the, the lowest cost areas, and we also went to debt as a large way to pull resources forward in time. That whole deal crashed in 2008 and was only revived by the central banks um, doing extreme temporary measures to uh, flood the system, buying their own debt, et cetera. And period D, I would term it Orwellian productivity, that we're relabeling things in order to keep them nominally going. For example, in Italy now, they're adding prostitution receipts and cocaine sales to GDP to make sure that they don't go over the um, austerity limit for the, the European un Union. So I would argue there is some element, I don't think it fully describes, but there's some element that the humans have created a giant heat engine and that each of us in North America acts as a 30-ton primate metabolically and that we will do everything we can to keep that going. Degrowth movement aside, we're going to talk about that in a second. Okay, synthesis. Uh, and then conclusions and then what to do. And I'm, I'm talking about a lot of stuff, so thank you for, for bearing with me. So I would argue that... Our society, actually all societies, past and future, we turn energy and resources into some sort of monetary marker. We turn those monetary markers into feelings plus waste. And this will always be the case. And the key is how can we get those dollars and feelings with little waste and with best efficiently using energy and resources. So I think what we're experiencing now is is that the benefits to society are not what they used to be. Living the American dream is not attainable the way that it used to be. In fact, in America, and I haven't had time to do the stats for Canada, but um, only the top blue line, which is the top 5% highest income earners in America, have the same after inflation income that they did from 2002. 95% of Americans, these other lines, have less after inflation wages than they did 10 years ago. For most people, growth is already over. And it's been over, papered over with central banks having below inflation interest rates, direct liquidity to institutions, um, guarantees for credit markets, 
too big to fail guarantees. Um, governments are buying our own debt. The United States buys 50%, I mean the Fed buys 50% of US government debt. Uh, and central bank balance sheet expansion. So our economic pie, if you consider energy as the red uh, main ingredient in the middle, what happens when we go and get all this Bakken shale and oil sands and things like that? Well, the pie grows, our economy grows, but energy grows bigger. And so the benefits to the rest of society are actually less than they were when the economy was smaller. So that's what happens when energy depletes is, yes, it grows the economy, but more of our economy is devoted to energy. And then what happens when we're flooding the system with money from the top? Well, the, the, the more money ends up going to the top 5% of stockholders and bondholders. W were you serious that the market was down 10% today? I didn't see that. But, um, but basically, the benefits don't trickle down to, to all of society. And, and real quickly, of course, you, the ecological economists in the audience will say, yeah, the green line is growth of our economies, but there's this thing underneath the surface of the glacier, which is this huge under negative things, negative growth, bad things like oil spills and species going away and uh, psychological counseling and prisons and things like that that are negative. So real quickly on renewables, um, we've constructed a society that and policies and institutions that are built around four to five cent a kilowatt hour and 20 to $30 a barrel oil. And so in order to keep those financial claims that people are expecting, we need to find some energy source that gives us that same benefit. And I would argue that more expensive fossil fuels and getting cheaper but still expensive renewables, where they intersect, is above that line. In other words, we first have to face an end of growth and then figure out what, how to navigate that and use our resources to navigate that because all of the different energy uh, options available to us together cannot continue to power a, a growing economy. And, and I know many of you don't want a growing economy. I'm going to talk about that in a second. I'm going to skip that. Um, I'm going to skip all that. So it's natural for humans when we have less benefits and when we're stressed and when we're anxious and things take longer and we don't have as much to blame someone. It's one of our evolutionary hangovers of in-group, out-group. We used to live in tribes of 150 people. And so when things happen badly, we blame the Republicans or the Democrats or the Muslims or the tree huggers or the rich or the poor or the Chinese or someone when our real villain is that fossil extraction, the benefits it's giving to society, they've asked for 17% annual pay raises since 2002, our fossil slaves have. And no one talks about that. That's the real underpinning of, of our, our social situation. And of course, um, status, as I mentioned earlier, is so critical that to even mention these things in high status, there's like a ceiling of what can be said in industry, in politics, in academia. Um, I gave a talk earlier today at UBC and some of the, the professors were very threatened by what I said because, you know, some, a lot of our, prof a lot of our institutions and, and academic institutions are linked to corporate money right now. And so you don't want to mess with the funding. And so stat, you know, saying the truth is a risk to people's status. Um, okay, so many of you have probably seen this curve before. It's, it's the Englehart World Values Survey where they showed that um, as you got richer, that your survival and well-being dramatically increased until a point, which in the United States is about $55,000, $60,000, where your marginal increase in your happiness and well-being actually flattened out. And so in a world facing the things that we're facing, I would argue that the pink circle would have some logic to, to it, except the lowest two quintiles of Americans spend all of their money. The top 5% of Americans spend 17% of their income. So if we were to do a wealth transfer from the rich to the poor, what would happen is a lot of people would spend a lot more money on energy and stuff and energy prices would go up and the poor would be right back to where they were. It's paradoxical, but I, I think there's, there's that element. Okay, so environmental success stories of the past always had a smoking gun. 
chlorofluorocarbons, DDT, unleaded gasoline. There was always like, oh my God, look at this disaster that's happening, and then we acted. But the problem now with climate is it's such a long-term thing. It's more like a Russian roulette thing than a smoking gun because there's a one in X chance that things are going to be really bad and our brains just don't respond to that as well. Another problem is not only current equity, but what about the people that come after us? What's Vancouver going to look like in 100 years or 300 years? Should we care about that? Um, what about interspecies ecosystem equity? These are questions that we don't really ask. So I'm showing, I'm throwing a lot of things your way. I really don't know what's going to happen in the future. The way that I view the future is a normal distribution that I think some things are, I think business as usual is incredibly unlikely to continue unless we find some amazingly cheap energy source and that would screw us really bad because we'd pull in all sorts of non-energy limiters and other species. But I don't know what's going to happen. And I think to have certainty about something is actually kind of dangerous. I think to be flexible and ask questions and open-minded is, is, is important. Okay, well, <laughs> uh, you can tell that my own steep discount rate, I was making my slides like right before this started. So this is the difference between degrowth, which a lot of you are affiliated with, and the end of growth, is that degrowth is that we can voluntarily choose to move away from growth. And the end of growth is that growth is leaving us anyways and we have to react to it. I subscribe to the end of growth because I, I see it happening and I think the preparations between the two are very different. I think the, the, the time to jettison GDP growth as our cultural aspiration was 20 or 30 years ago, now it's leaving us whether we want it or not. And if we switch to something like genuine progress indicator or some hedonic measure of, of GDP or success, the people that own the claims on GDP, they're not going to want to be paid back in happiness tickets. They're going to want like real things. So that, that's an issue, the, you know, the people that have things now. Okay, I don't believe the United States will ever voluntarily see everything that I've just said and said, you know what, we need to live a different way until it's 10 or 20 years too late. I actually think Canada maybe could. There's a lot less people here. There's a lot more natural resources. There's kind of this like cool feng shui of cultural people are a little bit more laid back. And they already understand a lot of the things that I've said. And they're not quite on the, the treadmill as, as Americans. I think it's a long shot here too, but I'm just pointing that out. So important to know, um, if we correlate energy use on the bottom with percent very happy in that Engelhart values curve, the United States uses twice as much energy as the Netherlands and we use 38 times the energy as the average Filipino, yet we're equally happy. So you might not say, I'm not moving from Vancouver to the Philippines, but if you were there and if all your friends were there, it, it wouldn't be so bad. And so there's not a huge correlation between large energy use and large satisfaction. Another bit of slightly good news is that we use about a hundred times more energy than our bodies need. In America, we eat 3,500 calories a day and our oil, coal, natural gas and renewable footprint is around 235,000 calories a day. So there's a huge amount of buffer for having a happy, meaningful life and culture with less energy. Okay, conclusions. Money is a marker for energy. For most people, growth is already over. There's actually no shortage of energy, but rather a longage of expectations of what we think is the future is going to require. Biology determines what we need. Culture determines how we get it. A lower consumption, more local and regional future is in the cards. What sort of future do we want? What are we willing to give up? And some key risks like climate change, seeing a smoking gun will be too late. Okay, what am I doing? Um, I'm going to skip this because it's... I have other things. Um, what can you be doing? Well, <laughs> probably the best thing you could be doing is not come to this talk. But the fact that you did come to this talk means you're interested and aware of, of these things. And so I will offer some suggestions. So we actually face numerous risks. We face the environment, which are long-term and some current risks, um, biodiversity, climate change, et cetera. Um, we face an end of growth. How are we going to respond to more and more poor people and deeper poverty, um, even if everything holds together? And, and we face kind of a, um, 
uh, kind of a psychological crisis of consumption. I can't speak for Canada, but in America, we have 4.5% of the world's population. We use 25% of the world's oil. We have 50% of the world's pharmaceutical prescriptions. We use 50% of the world's toys. Um, it just goes on and on that we, we also have the largest gun ownership by individuals um, in the world. I mean, it's, it's, even if we didn't have these other problems, we kind of have a moral fabric issue um, right now. So I would argue that um, efficiency and renewables and divestment, which are some of the things that environmentalists talk about, are very important but I don't think they're gonna solve climate change. I think divestment is a very good thing for a community, especially if they divest the money and put it back into the community, but I don't think it's gonna stop emissions. Um, so what are some things that are in the intersection of these three areas? Well, the last 15 minutes or so of my talk, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you some suggestions. So what to do? First of all, you have to embrace life and not let all this stuff get you down. Um, this is my 11-year-old golden retriever, and he's got all kinds of uh, fatty tumors on his body. And the two golden retrievers I owned before him died at six and seven of cancer. Crushed me. And ever since he was six, I've been worried that he's got cancer. I've been worried all the time. And that worry has uh, interfered with my enjoyment of my life with my dog. And so when you worry so much about the future, it interferes with your actual living day to day. So I would argue that yes, there are some nonlinear bad risk in the financial system, um, in the environment, and we kind of have in our brains, it's natural to expand those to larger odds than they actually are. And we just kind of have to recognize that, yeah, you know what, some of those dark scenarios are possible, but it doesn't do me anything to focus on them because it, it, it interferes with me being productive or active or, or doing things that I really enjoy. Number two is assert control in your life on the things that you do. There was a study that they hooked up uh, college students um, to a, a computer and they, they did blood tests and they had them do a test where the researcher was raising the speed of how these flashing lights would go by. And faster, faster, red, blue, pink, orange, and they would have to write orange, blue, blue, blue. And then at the end, they interviewed the student and they said, how did you feel about that? And they're like, oh, that was really hard, it was really stressful. And in fact, they took blood and the cortisol was elevated in their bloodstream. They were actually stressed. Then they did the same test where the student got to move the, the knob himself. And what actually happened is, hey, this is fun, blue, orange, red, I can do this. And actually they turned the knob to a higher level, it was going much faster. And they did the blood test in the interview. The interview was like, that was so much fun, that was great. Can I? And the blood test, there was no cortisol, they weren't stressed at all. So it, this is an example to take home that when you are in control of your own situation, it, it reduces your, your anxiety. Think, act in terms of real capital. So when you go through your life, if you just kind of think that, yes, this money in my bank account, these electronic digits I have, these are just markers for the things that I really care about, I think that's, that's helpful. Um, take back language. So this is a clip from the movie The Elephant Man where he exclaimed, I'm not an animal, I'm a man. And I feel like I am not a consumer, I'm a human being. And there's so many terms in our culture that are just laden with implications. And I am not a consumer. And so I think we have to start redefining terms that have power and meaning in our culture. And one is fossil fuels. They didn't have to be fuels. 200 years ago, we found them buried and they were like indistinguishable from magic. But the correct name is fossil hydrocarbon or fossil carbon. Um, so just little, little things like that I think are helpful. Learn something new, learn something old. I don't know what the future is going to be. I think we're going to have maybe high technology and gadgets and then also some old school stuff. Um, I'm learning to uh, pull logs with my draft horses. Um, my girlfriend is learning about canning. Um, there's like machine repair. I, mean, I think there's a, a foot in both worlds sort of thing there. Give something up. This is not exactly degrowth, but I think we have such a smorgasbord of things that for your own health, 
to give up some things that are probably not healthy or may not be around for the next 30 years or whatever probably is, is helpful. Um, you know, we don't need this sort of a Swiss Army knife. The, uh, the other one would probably suffice. And, and I actually have some ideas on this front that if we go back to that Engelhardt value curve, think about if you lived, you know, outside of the city, how much amazing utility and benefits you would get from the first watt or the first 10 watts or the first 100 watts of electricity. And why do we need as individuals, not factories, I understand the need for factories, but why as individuals do I need the ability to bake two turkeys at three in the morning? I don't. That doesn't really add to the benefit of my life, yet all of us can do that and flick on our switch with our ovens and, and everything. So anyways, um, so get rid of the super normal a little bit and go back to normal. Um, I, I think we have so many things that hijack our ability to focus on the present. I see it in young kids all the time. They just don't even have the patience to read a book because they're so connected to the gadgets that technology has, has given us. And I think there's, you know, uh, eating and status and drinking and partying and making money and shopping and playing games are, are you know, we just have to train our inner reptile to maybe walk away from time to time um, so that we want to go a step back in the other direction on these neural keys. One thing that I'm trying to start doing now is if I really want to send an email to someone, a thoughtful thing, uh, heartfelt, I won't do it. I'll write a letter instead and it just slows things down to a human scale and I've gotten letters in the mail and I just, wow, that was really nice. Um, and another thing is I get my dopamine from finding agates. I don't think you have agates in Vancouver, but where I live in Wisconsin, I go in the rivers and I don't, I'm not hurting anyone except for future agate hunters, but it's just my little pastime. That's how I get my dopamine. Um, okay, so this is, I just thought of this this afternoon. Every day at a certain time, and I suggest 4.30 because 4.20 is already taken, <laughs> that we take off the delusional glasses that it, don't talk to anyone, don't be on the internet, best to be out in nature, and try and just for 10 minutes a day, look beyond the delusionality of the media and what people are saying, and look at our situation and try to be objective and as non-delusional as possible. I do not think that we can be non-delusional. We have to embrace our delusionality, but we have to recognize it. And I don't want to be so pejorative that we're all delusional, because I'm delusional too. I've been so cocksure about things in the past, and then a few years later, I'm like, wow, I was wrong about that. But of course, it's adaptive not to recognize that I was wrong about it. But anyways, I think to just recognize that we're delusional once a day might be helpful. Um, personally divest. Again, I think divestment is a great idea. But I don't think it's going to reduce carbon unless you personally divest because the hedge funds are going to buy the Exxon stock five cents cheaper as long as we keep flying and driving and whatever. And what I like to do is when I drive, a, I'm trying to do all my errands on one day a week. I'm trying to. I still don't quite make it that way. But when I get in a car now or when I get on a plane to come here, I consciously think, how freaking awesome is this? I'm this evolved ape flying in an airplane across the country in four hours. And I just, for a brief second, am amazed and appreciate the kind of smorgasbord of Disneyland opportunities that we have today. Choose your tribe. So my tribe used to be Wall Street cubicles of people high-fiving when they got a $20,000 commission. And uh, a friend of mine said that you're on a train car, all of us are, and the conductor is a sociopath out of control and there's nothing we can do to ch change him, so just find the people you want to hang out with in the dining car. And I, I think that's, that's right. I think we need to choose our tribe, and our tribe can actually, um, I wrote this down because I, I like the wording from uh, Howard Odom, that when we work on these things, they accumulate gradually the means for subsequent action. And I think that's what we're doing by these little degrowth meetings and whatever, is we're starting to prepare for something ahead that we don't quite yet know, 
And this tribal bonding and understanding and being on the same page is very important. Um, be pro-social. I think the first response to peak oil and financial collapse and some of these things is people to go buy gold coins and guns. Maybe not in Canada. Uh, but I, I, I think we need to reject that because that's just another variety of how messed up our current society is because it's everyone out for themselves. It's an individualist thing. And I'm not saying we should all be communes or anything, but we need to be pro-social because that is the strongest driver in the human brain is uh, D.S. Wilson, E.L. Wilson, great quote from them, selfishness does beat altruism within groups, but altruistic groups beat selfish groups. Everything else in biology is commentary. I happen to believe that and I, I study those, those topics. Okay, I'm getting to the, the last of very long talk. Die liking yourself. When I die, I want to be on my deathbed and think, you know what, I wasn't a bad guy. I think what I did was, was okay and it had meaning. I didn't hurt a lot of people and I helped and educated people. And of course, to die liking yourself, you have to live liking yourself. And it's very difficult now. We're getting all these, you, you, you're kind of nodding your head and, and coming, coming with me on this, this talk I've had. But then tomorrow you're going to go back to your jobs and there's going to be things due. And, and it's very hard to have a foot in both worlds, but that's what we have to try to do because the stakes are enormously high and when we were born on this planet and what's happening to the planet is, is monumental and, and we have to play a role in passing the baton to some future that at least keeping it in the fairway. I don't think there's anything that us in this room can do about climate change, but we can keep things in the fairway so that maybe some positive things can happen in the future. And I think we have to, have to appreciate uh, the other species that, that we have kind of morphed from pillagers to maybe fiduciaries. And um, I, I don't, if I had something to suggest to you, go out and do this tomorrow, I would tell you. So I would just make an agreement like this or make in your own words with yourself. I don't know when or where or how I will have to act, but I will not accept dead oceans, ecosystems, etc. And you just make that commitment not to brag, not to have social status. Hey, I made that commitment. I wrote that little letter Nate told me to do. Just with yourself. Um, because I think that's the only one that's going to know about it. And of course, we're going to be underdogs. Um, but a lot of things from underdogs in the past have happened. And the problem is, is that the volume of things that are terrible is drowned out by the volume of things that distracts us. In the 1970s, um, Rex Weiler, who's one of the guys at Greenpeace who lives in Vancouver, um, had the clever brilliance to have a Zodiac go in between a whaling ship and the whale, and people were strapped to the Zodiac, willing to die to save whales. In the 1970s, 10 million Americans came out on Earth Day. Now we have Earth Day and like 40 or 50 people come out in closeted things. Given the slide I showed before with what's happened in the natural world since Greenpeace did that with whales, and now we've got all these other animals that are, are succumbing, what sort of creative things can we do now? Um, I think part of the problem is in the past we just had books. Uncle Tom's Cabin, other than the Bible, was the most read book in the 19th century, and people were outraged. It was a civil rights book. And now when we're outraged, I'm going to go blog about this. And I'm going to send a tweet, God dang it. And as soon as we do that, it diffuses some of our angst. And okay, I did my part because someone read that tweet and they're going to do something. Um, so I believe at this stage of the game, we need not intelligence. We need more alien thinking, thinking outside of the box, thinking in weird, creative ways. And speaking directly to the degrowth movement, no offense intended, I think to have people living on half of what they used to is probably helpful for their own lives, but that's not going to impact things. We need warriors and mystics. And if you want to live on half of what you used to, I think that's a great example, but that's not going to move the needle. Um, and if there's a drowning person and you're the only one on the beach that knows how to swim, that's a responsibility. At least that's how I view things. So in closing, 
in my teens and 20s, I was motivated by more novelty, more stuff, more games. And then in my 20s, I was motivated by people that had more money than me. I had to find billionaires. I wanted people that had more money. And then in my 30s and 40s, I was um, motivated by people that had more knowledge than me. Um, and now I'm, I'm motivated by people that have more ethics or more morality or are stronger people than me. And I hope that uh, all humanity can follow that. I think Vancouver's got a great start and great people, and let's get started. Thank you. Uh, so we have time for questions. That was kind of long, but... Could you provide more examples of that third point of the capital and the real? Well, uh, you have some digits in your bank account, and those could be used, it's power. You could use them in any ways that you want. Um, if you know that energy is the underpinning of value in our society, solar panels make a lot more sense than having a bunch of digits sitting in the bank. So ideas like that, that you turn digits while we still can into real things in your house or your community or your city or your province. Um, you know, lots of different examples. Solar panels would just be one. Yes. Um, first of all, thank you very much for this. I think more of this dialogue needs to get out there. And just by being here, as you say, is, is the first step. And hopefully more people get on this, this train of thought because it's very necessary, I think. Um, I work for a company with uh, an international sustainable development. And something that um, always uh, strikes me and never ceases to amaze me is the concrete example of how people like Tim Woods are happier than a lot of my friends with like six digit figures. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll give you a flip answer and then a more realistic answer. The flip answer is if every woman in America decided that people, guys growing great tomato plants were sexier than people that were real estate developers, it would change overnight. Books would sell out on how to garden. Um, the, the true answer is it's probably going to be a little scout team leading by example, figuring out that they're happier with using less and like, wow, look at Kathy and Jim, look at what they're doing. I want to do that. So there's a little bit of that. And the large swath of people behind are going to come when they have no other options, I think. Um, but I, I think, you know, I'm living on not a lot of money. I'm actually slightly stressed about it because my savings is spent. Um, but I've never been happier in my life because I get paid by comments like you just made and I get paid in things other than dollars and that has meaning to me even if I die penniless um, that has meaning so how do people get meaning when they still have food on the tables and whatever now I would argue that some of the places with tin roofs in some ways may be better off than we are because our expectations are so high and any disruption of that like a fireman or whatever in America has $150,000 a year pension and oh no they're going to cut that to 130 and you know blood will be shed over things like that so I think it's that's the biggest risk that I see environment aside in the next 10 years I can't speak for Canada but in America it's how we're going to respond to less doesn't have to be a lot less, just a little less. And how are we going to have the social um, cohesion necessary to deal with angry people who don't understand why we're having less? Um, so I, I think that, yeah, it's, it's a complicated uh, tapestry to answer your question. But you're absolutely right that how do we decouple in the long run 
we don't need all that stuff to be happy. So there's going to be little models all around, maybe in Vancouver, on how to start down that path. And, and something will catch, hopefully. More, more questions. Yes? Uh, of, uh, distributing a smaller pie amongst the uh, uh, of our society. I think capitalism in its truest sense has never really been tried. Um, I think capitalism the way it is tried now, the evils of capitalism are partially but not fully also the evils of human nature and especially when we come upon this giant treasure trove and get three Aladdin's wishes and we've used two of them, we only have one left. And I think Wall Street gets a bad name because they're all greedy jerks, but you know what? There's real estate developers, there's doctors, there's lawyers that are just as sociopathic as Wall Street people. They're following the, the cues and the rules that we made and I, I think those rules are going to have to change, but I'm actually as worried about the rich as I am about the poor because you try telling someone that's 10 million that they got to go down to 5 million and they're going to have with their outsized influence and their friends, they're going to go ballistic. Um, I don't think, well, first of all, if we really care about climate change, a market economy and democracy are incompatible with solving the problem. I think we need a world government, a world currency, or, or something like that, and that sounds awfully scary, but if we're serious about climate change, I don't think a little carbon tax is, is going to do it, because a carbon tax makes the energy benefits we talked about worse. Um, I think a carbon tax, we should have done that 50 years ago. Um, when we found this fossil magic 200 years ago, that was bad planning what happened. So, um, but you know what? We had to go through that. And that's, I think, the main thing that I would leave, uh, or, or I, I would, a, a thought that I would leave with you is we've done all these things, but we've also figured out that we've done all these things. We've figured out the science of the supply and demand balance sheet of the human ecosystem. We've figured out the environment. We've figured out where we came from. And that has to be worth something something different in nature. There are emergent properties that we cannot understand. And the knowledge about all this stuff is somehow going to percolate and, and make, it's, it's kind of like the Heisenberg principle that when you're observing some scientific thing that the observing impacts the actual experiment. And I think our knowledge about the situation is going to do the same thing. Uh, and someone right by you had their hand up. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, just, I'm not sure what your take is on Uh, it's complicated, and I will tell you exactly what I think. I think we're headed for 100% renewables. I think the richest places in the world 100 years from now will be those that have hydropower, and especially um, storable, pumpable hydro. I think the technology of solar and wind is very mature and amazing. The problem I have is that we're expecting to unplug coal and natural gas and plug in solar and wind without addressing all these other concerns and that we're going to continue to do this. And I think not only is that probably not desirable, but it's physically not possible with the intermittence and everything beyond maybe 15 to 20 percent. Vancouver's different, of course. You've got a lot of, uh, of water and, and, and other sources here. So renewables are great. We need to go to renewables immediately but also with a plan on how to have a lower overall footprint, if that makes sense. Okay. Uh, yeah, more questions? Yes. Is your presentation available online? Or, and if not, is there uh, any other slides are available? available. Uh, Justin has filmed this. This, w this whole presentation will be repeatable online, if that's what you meant. Yeah, and I have, Lots of writing on these things, too. Um, Kevin. So, yeah, I was wondering about, we have 
Over 7 billion people on this planet right now and we're using a certain amount of energy currently and that's going to fall into the future. What are your outlooks 50 years from now, 100 years from now as far as the energy available per capita of a world citizen at those time points versus what we have here in the West now? Well, well if we have yes. 7 billion people 50 years from now or 100 years from now, I am virtually certain the energy per capita will be less than it is today. We might have less people. We might have more people. If we have more people, the UN just stated with 80% confidence that world population in the year 2100 would be between 10.2 and 12 billion. With 80% confidence. Um, so... I don't see how that's possible. I think 2050, maybe, and we'd have an awful lot of poor people. Unless we design some fabulous energy technology that's very, very, very inexpensive. And then we pull in non-limiting resources from, from the periphery. And then, then it's the end of nature, really. Um, I think that, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's Canada, the US, places like that that use a lot more energy than other people are, are going to probably continue to do that until we can't. And uh, it, it's an open question. I mean, are you asking me, do we have too many people? Or are we asking how much energy we're going to have? We have an, a lot of coal, a real lot of coal. It's I'm not really cheap, but yeah? I'm asking more about, let's say if we, if all of humanity could get to like perhaps a tenth of the current Westerners' energy uh -huh. use, is that going to be here 50 years from now, 100 years from now? A tenth, a tenth of, of current, current Western energy use in 50 years, like, yes. Yeah, that we have we have that much. Now, the, the the issue is energy benefits, right? We have a lot of fossil carbon left, and let's put aside climate for the time being. As energy requires more and more energy to extract, the human benefits will become less. So if there's like uh, we need to spend one barrel of oil to get f five back, we cannot have this sort of arrangement because it would be too expensive to transport stuff from China and Korea and across Canada and things like that. But it would still power a robust society with, with different makeups. Um, so yeah, we, there's, there's a lot of, you know, nuclear is a sore subject because it's the logical extension for energy density from trees to coal to diesel to nuclear, but the externalities of that keep on paying for a lot of years. So, you know, it, it is kind of the one thing that makes sense. It's too expensive to continue economic growth, but it's not too expensive to continue some meaningful civilization. But what about the cost, Fukushima and, and all that? I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, more questions? Yes, sir. How and why globalization accelerated this process? Yes, yes because, because uh, uh, how the question is how did globalization accelerate the process of process of what? Well, well, we we exported the uh, American, American and Canadian, Canadian model of consumption to a lot of places. places. We created little networked um, points of supply chain distribution. We exported our import subst substitution model to South America and other places where they should um, focus only on this thing that they were less bad at and be really good at it and then add that to the global mix. And so we created more consumers globally and we created very long, complicated, multi-part uh, supply chains um, that all required energy. And the problem, the reason that energy is not recognized as being a driver of our problems is because until recently, it was never constrained. So the economic textbooks were right. They were right for the wrong reasons, but uh, the Cobb-Douglas function did work, and we were just never constrained on energy. Now that's starting to break down. Um, so to answer your question, the, the reason that globalization and debt um, accelerated all this is it just made a bigger human heat engine, uh, bigger, wider, deeper if that makes sense. More questions or comments or things you disagree with, or things you like, or things that you suggest, things you care about? You, sir. Um, I always worry about how, well, this has been happening for a long time, but how the rich are going to stay richer in fewer numbers, and 
Yep. yep. And also, that's one thing. Rich, rich in digital, digital markers. markers. Not, not really rich. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and control. Yeah. Um, and, and we're talking, you know, when we talk about the population of 7.3 billion, 7.3 billion, we're talking, what is Western society or developed countries of that? Like, not even one billion? No, it is that. I'm just wondering, you know, we have a lot of other people in the world that yeah. are suffering that want a higher standard of life that are thriving towards that. So here's my comment on that. Well, I think there's three billion or four billion people that survive on, on two dollars a day. Some outrageous number like that. So what is the problem? Is it overpopulation or is it overconsumption? I would argue the third thing, which is that the people that are overconsuming, us, more Americans than Canadians, but kind of the same. We're exporting that via marketing and TV and, and movies and everything as the signal for how all the Chinese and Indians should aspire to. That's the real problem. If we were just consuming, that would be bad and there would be some consequences. But if the Chinese and Indians and whoever were like, look at those dummies, what they're trying to do, then it might not be as bad. But they are like striving not only to be like the average American, but like a millionaire American. That's the problem, is we're sending the wrong signals to the rest of the world. And, and what you're asking is a really deep question, and it gets back to my poverty comment. Alleviating poverty today might make poverty worse in the future. I don't know the answer to these things. I would agree with that. Yeah. Yes? two comments to that. One is I've been fortunate to have traveled a lot in my life. And I've been to places like Zambia and Malawi and Ecuador and these remote villages where people have nothing, are among the happiest, healthiest people I've ever seen in my life. And their parents will buy them a toy for Christmas in May and it'll be hanging up on the wall, and they get to look at it for six months, and they get this like slow-release dopamine that this toy, and then the other toy is a soccer ball for the whole town. So that's one comment. The other comment is um, that the price elasticity to food is different in North America than it is in some of these countries, and when we had the, the oil and food price spike in 2008, the price of wheat went through the moon, but the price of bread for Americans went from like $2.70 to $2.95 a loaf. But in Africa, it tripled or quadrupled, and people had to choose, that's, you might know of this, there's African countries like Nigeria, Zambia's one, where families choose, I'm on Thursday, I'm on Tuesday, oh, you're a Sunday. They choose a day of the week not to eat because they can't afford food every day. So, yeah, I, I hear you. Okay, more questions. I, I'm going to kind of be happy when this is over just because I've got this sun shining on me. But uh, no, I'm, I'm happy to stay as long as people want to talk. Uh, comments, questions? Someone else had their hand up and I called on this fellow over in this area. No? Oh, it was, it was me, I think, with a comment. And, and uh, I guess I want to go another step in terms of what you were saying about uh, oh, the getting a social movement together or working this forward as a some kind of groups, group, whatever. Um, the uh, best presentation that I've seen before yours, okay, was uh, UBC by a guy named George Marshall, who wrote a book that you might have. Right, right, right. Yeah, okay. let's not even, don't even think about it. Right. Have you seen that? Um, wonderful presentation, wonderful book. And I'm, I'm just slowly reading through it, got to the point where he's comparing church movements and how they got established with, hey, what the environmental climate crisis, whatever movement could be dealing with, and how come we're not working like that, you know? 
Um, I mean, that kind of aha, uh -huh, you don't get it yet. It's still in the middle of the book, but boy, uh, you, you read, yeah, I'd recommend that. The reason I was bringing that up was to ask you about, well, but you seem to be sort of saying, no, 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 just do your own thing. Fix, fix your life for yourself. Um, I, I don't really think that's all you meant there. No, well, that's, that's not, not, that's not, not all I meant. meant. Uh, I think movements are vital. Uh, for social capital and keeping things in the fairway to get things possible. I think engaging the churches or the church model is, is very important. I don't know what to do. I really don't know what to do. These things, these last 12 things, are things that I, I think they might help. I think they at least keep you sane and keep you in the game uh, worrying and thinking about all these things. And I'm, I'm, I'm doing those things until I figure out something better. But I think larger discussions and larger movements are very important, but a lot of them now only see a little bit of the picture and they're focused on the wrong, the, the wrong thing, in my opinion. So to see the whole picture and know what to do, I don't know yet. Um, yeah, but that's a good point. Thank you. How about my friend Gwen, who didn't have any idea what I was going to talk about, but she's an environmentalist in Vancouver, and I invited her. Gwen, you have anything to ask or say? Uh, well, I, I was impressed. I thought it was going to be uh, dry and, and maybe a little bit boring. And I thought... Uh, <laughs> 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 this is your friend talking. <laughs> no, but I, I, thought, I thought it was insightful and hopeful, and it, was, it, it also spoke to your heart as well as your head. And I think that's something that's needed. Yeah, yeah, I, I do, do, I do, I do think, think we need to do that. And, and one, one problem is that people in a certain tribe will agree on 99% of something, but then on solar panels they'll disagree. And they'll spend 90% of their energy fighting over that 1%. And infighting within movements is the killer. And we're all on the same team on caring for a better future, and we have to keep that in mind that, you know, we, we argue amongst ourselves amongst, uh, with minor p points to our greater feeling. And I, I, I do think, um, I used to give these talks and I would stop before this last section. I would just say, this is what's going on and there you go. And you can't invite someone into this story without asking them, or without offering some action. Uh, you know, I've got Half of my relatives are born-again Christians and the whole evolution thing, I can't even go there. So it's very important to um, offer someone uh, a, a pathway towards something positive. Um, and so, yeah, I think the head and the heart, that's a, that's a good way to put it. Thank you all for coming. So thank you everybody for coming here this evening. If you'd like to help by pa packing away a few chairs and also we're going to be having more speakers later on and, so, and a conference coming up and anybody that's interested in being involved in figuring out who is the next speaker, come to some of our meetings, add your name to the email list, make a donation, we're going to spend it on beer, uh, come on out. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>